Well, enough about what's going on in the theme park world today. Let's go back to the theme park world of yesterday as we continue the retrospective, as we continue looking back at the other video I uploaded unlisted 10 years ago, the Epcot one. So let us cue our Dave Does Disney Decade retrospective. Seriously, on Dave Does Disney. <laughs> Cram it! I don't want to hear it, you freaking douchebag! Mickey Mouse just called me a douchebag. And now part two of Dave Does Disney. Last time we explored the Magic Kingdom, which it turns out is a slightly inferior clone of the original Disneyland. While it has its good points, most of the differences from Disneyland aren't exactly improvements. Certainly a fun way to spend a day, but not as fun as the classic. So now we move on to what is reportedly Disney Orlando's biggest advantage over Disney California, Epcot. This is the first uh, shot I got for Dave Does Disney. I, I went to Epcot before I went to Magic Kingdom because, um, again, I was going with my friends where they wanted to go because I didn't have a car of my own. So this was, I might have shot some B-roll before shooting this bit, but uh, this is the very first footage of me that I shot for Dave Does Disney. <laughs> yes, I predicted Book of Mormon. <laughs> I demand royalties from Trey Parker and Bobby Lopez. If Magic Kingdom is the heart of Walt Disney World, then Epcot is probably the thorax. But if Magic Kingdom is the face, then Epcot is the heart. Epcot stands for Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow, and it was one of Walt Disney's final major dreams before his death. It's the entire reason Walt Disney World exists. Originally, Walt didn't want Disney World to be a theme park at all, but a utopian city where people would actually live and new technologies and city design and convenient living could be tested out. The only reason Walt reluctantly agreed to build the Magic Kingdom is because the You're board not wrong, directors Chandler. didn't think the idea would fly without an East Coast Disneyland to draw tourists. Walt's ideas were insanely ambitious, even for today, and even though they were all for the greater good, some of them were actually a little scary. Citizens of Epcot wouldn't own their homes, so Disney would have the right to make any upgrades and changes that they saw fit. Yes, the city would have been built specifically to test new technologies, but still slightly creepy prospect. Other people have done much better videos about Epcot since this one, about the history and legacy of Epcot since this one. Uh, people like, obviously, Tony and Defunct Land, they have uh, gone in bigger depth about the weirdness that uh, Walt's final theme was like a socialism that was run by capitalism. <laughs> that, that, that's what he wanted to bring apart. So, uh, it, uh, I, I, again, I cover this stuff briefly, and were I doing these videos today, there are so many areas I would have gone more in depth on, but I was uh, making the videos that I was capable of making at the time. After his death, the company realized, wait a minute, we can't run a city. We're too busy modernizing Robinson Crusoe. That'll be our real legacy. I have never seen that movie. I just looked up what movies came out like close after Walt's death that weren't the Jungle Book, and uh, that seemed like the funniest movie to reference. So plans for Epcot were scaled way back, and it turned into Epcot Center, another theme park, but with a more educational bent. Years later, the Disney company would open Celebration, a planned community where people live, so it sort of carries on the original Epcot idea on a much smaller scale. The same way Stars Hollow carries on the Gotham City idea. But Epcot... Uh, first Gilmore Girls reference? Not quite the first Batman reference, only because I used an MST2K reference that referenced Batman. <laughs> Epcot is a theme park now, which means that I actually care about it. And even just looking at the map, you can see it's a different experience than the earlier Disney parks. While Disneyland and Magic Kingdom are both designed as a circle with all the lands gathered around a central point and everything within easy access, Epcot is actually designed as more of a figure eight with two major individual sections. Future World Future Wax and World Showcase. These two areas are meant to embody the two sides of the original Epcot dream, Innovation for living in the future while appreciating diversity and cultural heritage uniting the world. We'll begin here with Future World, the world's first theme park based on a Jonathan Colton song. Gonna be the, future soon. I won't 
the general theme of Future World is, shockingly enough, the future. I can tell you about the future. Attractions such as Interventions are meant to show us the latest cutting-edge technology. There's all sorts of educational exhibits. Yeah, 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 just get to the rides already. The most iconic image associated with Epcot is Spaceship Earth, or as you probably know it, the giant golf ball of doom. The original version of this ride was actually written by Ray Bradbury. I'm aware of this work. And I understand this ride has gone through various permutations and... I also I used Martin Prince's Ray Bradbury slam because that was the... Uh most pop cultural Ray Bradbury joke I had in my uh, mind at the time. Uh, obviously, we're doing this video today. The background music here would be Rachel Bloom's Fuck Me, Ray Bradbury. <laughs> uh, that, that's if I was doing it today. In renovations over the years. But all I can really tell you about is the current version, which features Judy Dench teaching us about the history of communication between animatronic cultures. And she probably got an Oscar nomination for her narration here. There's also a video screen that theorizes about your future based on the unflattering photo they take at the beginning of the ride and some data they ask regarding your interests. Um, well, why does the Disney Corporation want to know so much about me? Ah, ah, no reason! After spending some time on Spaceship Earth, you're about ready to leave Earth on another spaceship with Mission Space. Oh, by the way, your segues really suck! Hey, shut up. Now, I know the space program may be having budget trouble, but do they really need to resort to recruiting random tourists from Disney World to fly their missions? Maybe they could afford real astronauts if they didn't spend so much money hiring Gary Sinise to run the mission. Oh, wait, this is the space program from the future! A planet where scientists evolved from actors? Okay, Mission Only Space is actually years in the future. Awesome. It's a centrifuge motion simulator that gives you the feeling of flying your own mission to Mars. It can be an intense experience, which is why they give you two options. You take the green card, and you go on the easy mission. You go on a simple ride, and believe what you want to believe. You take the orange card. I was never fully happy with this Matrix joke here. I just wanted, like, I, I realized I was just doing dry description, and I wanted to figure out a way to put some humor into it. And when I can't think of any other type of joke, I just do a pop culture reference, and... I don't know, the, the Matrix was the best I could think of as I was trying to spend less time on this video than I spent on the, on the uh, previous one. But, uh, you know. And you go time. on the hard mission, and I show you how deep the motion sickness goes. As you can see, astronaut flight training isn't like anything you've ever experienced before. It is intense. But if getting nauseous in space is too much for you, there are plenty of chances to get nauseous without leaving the atmosphere, such as Test Track. Test Track is a pretty neat ride that lets you fulfill your childhood dream of being a crash test dummy. Oh, nobody else had that dream? Yeah, I didn't either. Nope. After waiting in line and seeing our fellow dummies get tortured, we hop into a car which is being tested by a team led by John Michael Higgins. I shall have... A birthday cake! In every actor, there lives a tiger, a pig, an ass, and a nightingale. You never know which one's going to show up. Am I the only uh, in that reviewer to ever reference Christopher Guest for your consideration? Quite possibly. <laughs> I shall duck behind that little garbage car. And, much like Higgins' very diverse list of roles, guys, pro. what makes Test Track cool is the variety of thrill ride experiences it gives you. From slamming on the brakes to setting you on fire... Test Track does not settle for being just an ordinary roller coaster. After ensuring that we'll never want to drive a car again, we decide to kick back and relax by the seas. This is where Future World starts to become a bit of a misnomer. A more accurate description might be Science World or Environment World, but I guess... The Spoonie reference is also one I would not make today as I try to distance myself from that community in general, but... uh. You asked for it, here is one of the kitties. Oh. Running away. Wisp uh, does not want to share the screen time. There, we will see if Sir Terry also shows up at any point, but you know, the cats do what they want to do. Cats, uh, the cats work on their own pace. 
Um, but yeah, I did predict the, uh, it, this kid is whip. Um, but yes, I did predict the notion that a uh, future world would be uh, a misnomer and that they would actually change the name to reflect that, even though the new naming convention is weird enough on its own. Let me make sure I'm actually sharing the audio too, you know, so that we can do this. I guess some of the things here educate children on how to make a better future, but still, it's about as accurate a name as music television. Anyway, this. I also I kept that community clip going longer than I would have otherwise, just because I didn't have any other B roll to uh, to put under that section. These first off is the Nemo and Friends ride. Now at Disneyland, the old submarine ride in Tomorrowland got a Finding Nemo overhaul a few years back using a combination of animatronics and animation projected onto glass. The Nemo ride here is basically the same as that, except without the coolness of being in a submarine. Instead, you're in a clam-shaped people mover with the animatronics right in front of your face. It's without the coolness of being in a submarine, but it's also without the claustrophobia of being in a submarine, so, uh, so that's one of the that version has. One advantage it has over the Disneyland submarine version is at the end the characters are projected into an actual aquarium. Not gonna lie, it's pretty cool to see the Nemo character surrounded by real fish. Although it's kinda ruined by the inane sing-along. <laughs> After the ride, you find a large educational center, including aquariums, scuba demonstrations, feedings, playgrounds, and Turtle Talk with Crush. Turtle Talk is a fun concept. There's a screen with a computer display of Crush, who is being controlled and voiced by an unseen cast member. Oh, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain! The so I found the man behind the curtain clip from YouTube rather than ripping it from DVD, and it was weird because the YouTube account I ripped it from um, it was just a scene, but like the description on the YouTube posting was some really weird, like political diatribe about how, about how, I think it was like how Al Gore is the man behind the curtain pulling the strings for environmental regulations. And I'm like, what on earth are you babbling about? I just need a Wizard of Oz clip. Uh, so yeah. But the clip was just a clip in the movie, and that's what I needed at the time. But I just remember being very weirded out by, uh, by that particular YouTube posting of it. Control over the animated character allows him to interact with the audience, especially the kids sitting near the front. Now, obviously, this isn't the first or only place that this sort of live control of an animated character has been done, but it's still a wonderful setting for it. The blending of the lines between animation and live performance brings the character to life in a way that pre-programmed animatronics or costumes with static facial expressions can't. And I think it's the sort of creative experiment in storytelling and character portrayal that Disney should be all about. So, after spending some time under the sea, if you're ready to come up for air, you can crawl onto the land. If it's raining, you'll probably spend quite a bit of time in the land because it's all indoors. It centers around a food court featuring all-natural foods, plus on the second floor there's a rotating sit-down restaurant. The land contains three main attractions. First is... I don't believe there's like a filter or anything for the Turtle Talk with the Crush voice. I believe they just hire uh, cast members who are very good at emulating the voice. Um, I know uh, one of the former Turtle Talk crushes was uh, Jeff Scott Carey, husband of Emily Clark from Stealing Focus. And I believe it was just, he can do the surfer voice. So he, uh, he, uh, yeah was hired because he could come close to the voice Andrew Stanton does in the movie. Of course, weird, weird political YouTube is a very weird, uh, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I do like that they seem to be putting thought into the future world redesign it and the redistricting of, of like where, how things flow into each other. Uh, 
yeah, I'm I'm optimistic for the future of Epcot, but um, yeah, God knows when I'll be able to say he's coming to Florida again. That's a fun, <laughs> a fun anecdote for a child to say out loud at Turtle Talk with Crush. Well, sure, like every story is full of political. Uh, <laughs> Every story is full of politics, but it was funny. Like, it was so weird to me that somebody posted the scene that was not about this specific current day political grudge they had, but they repurposed it to being about that, but they didn't make any changes to the clip itself. They just posted the clip wholesale and their weird political bullshit was delegated to the description. It, it was very odd. I think uh, I'm also, the stream is probably on a bit of delay from the chat because I am, you know, slowly catching up to the comments everyone has to say. And I apologize. And I don't know how to um, catch up to that without uh, without stopping and starting over. So uh, thanks for bearing with me as I'm a few minutes behind your questions at all times. Um, Anyway, uh, for the land, I use the Back to the Future 3 music because uh, the Old West is the land and Back to the Future is Future World, so it seemed thematically appropriate, question mark. I don't know, but it, it was, uh, it was a, a place where I specifically was not using um, um, Disney music in that moment. Is an educational short it. film featuring Simba, Timon, and Pumbaa called The Circle of Life, an environmental fable. So, Nathan Lane, Ernie Sabella, and a Matthew Broderick impersonator teaching kids about pollution? Sounds like a recipe for subtlety. Let's make it yours! Check, please. Then there's Living with the Land, a boat ride that first passes through some typical Disney ride displays about the history of farming, but then takes you on a tour through Disney's actual greenhouses, where you can occasionally see farmers at work growing the stuff you're getting in the food court. There are also labs where new farming technologies are being developed, so I guess they touch on that whole future thing a little bit. Finally, there's Soren, a ride which originally opened at Disney's California Adventure under the name Soren Over California. It's the same exact ride, but I guess they shortened the title to Soarin' here because people don't like to be reminded that there is a California with a theme park that costs less and offers more than Magic Kingdom. Gansel, you're trying my patience! Ugh, <sighs> fine. I'm sorry. Would would you feel better if I badmouthed California for a while? Uh, not really. I'd prefer it if you didn't complain at well, all. Well, here we go. I'm that that might be the last moment for me, the voice of reason, before he just gets, uh completely angry all the time um and yeah here comes the the dca rant <laughs> yes before uh before tiktokers just robbed the garden all the time that's true that's true uh, uh patrick warburton follows uh follows the emperor's new podcast that is very i'm i'm, I'm very happy for you <laughs> Um, uh, but, uh, the, the DCA rant here, when I posted this as a best of clip, I got some comments from people who were surprised that I was so hard on DCA 1.0. And I, I was surprised by that. I was like, wait, at, at, at one point, at what point did, uh, did the Disney parks fandom shift from, DCA shouldn't have been built to DCA shouldn't have been fixed. So, uh, see, it was easy for them to keep Warburton for Soren around the world because uh, they had already done the re-edit to the Soren pre-show for Epcot where they cut out him saying, well, California, so they could just use, and you can tell the difference um, in the Soren, not only uh, in the California version does he say Soren over California, but in the California version, uh, the kid that he says nice work pal to is wearing a Disneyland sweatshirt. And in the uh, in the Epcot version, 
they Ab- digitally removed over California, they digitally blacked out the word Disneyland off his sweatshirt. So now even in DCA, when you ride Soren around the world, they removed Disneyland from the sweatshirt and it's it's weird. <laughs> it's weird that they did that, right? It's it's a little like no nobody would have a <laughs> yes, CA's original Paradise Pier, which emulates the exact kind of park that Walt was trying to build the opposite of is what Walt would have wanted. <laughs> that is exactly right. <laughs> uh the Disney Park fandom can be uh volatile. Um I miss OG Storm, so I, I far prefer over California. Um, I'm happy that DCA digs out over California every once in a while. That's what I say. I see people in California wearing Disney World clothes all the time. I, I don't know why they thought it was so important. Like, like it really seems like when they were... Uh, put in Soren and Epcot, they wanted people to not know that it was a ride that came from the Disneyland Resort. They they really wanted they really wanted everybody to think that it was a brand new thing that had no connection to Disneyland, even though the ride ended at Disneyland. It's like I do not understand the decisions that were made. I do not understand. I've only been to California Adventure once, and it was in the first year of its existence. Obviously, that is no longer true. (laughs) Obviously, I've been to DCA many a time since then. I hear it's improved since then, with the focus on adding more Pixar characters and things like that. But in the year I visited, it was weak. It had maybe three good rides, one of which was a generic Rapid River ride that you could find. Yeah, it's it's like they, they... They didn't hide the fact in the publicity that Soren came from Disneyland Resort, but they did not, like, on the ride itself, other than the final scene, there's no trace of Disneyland's existence. Like, I, I, so many Disney decisions, I, I just will never understand. At any amusement park. The main good ride was Soren over California. You know how when you were a kid, the only place to see an IMAX movie was at the museum, and they were always about the evolution of scuba technology or something like that? Well, Disney decided that a huge screen that envelops your entire range of vision wasn't gimmicky enough for an educational film, so they added a ride element, where you're suspended in fake glider-type seats in front of the screen that tilt, turn, and spray various smells at you. Although, as I recall, in its opening year, the aroma technology had not yet been perfected and we were usually just treated to one strong smell lingering throughout the whole ride, usually either pine or oranges. The ride was integral to California Adventure because, well, what else were you going to do? But here in Epcot, you have more options for rides. And yet this one is still extremely popular, running out of fast passes very early in the day and having an interminably long line. Still, it's a good ride. It's worth doing at least once. And I've always said that I'd listen to Patrick Warburton if he read the phone book, so I'll take giving the pre-flight safety instructions. Nice work, pal. If the rain stops long enough to let us leave the land, we can move on to the Imagination Center, where Eric Idle had to find something to do between Meaning of Life and Stamalot. Oh, you're no fun anymore. So he decided to reward the efforts of all the world's greatest imaginary scientists. Like this guy, who invented Flubber. Only 36 years after Fred McMurray already invented it. Until recently, the Imagination Center was the home of the 3D show Honey, I Shrunk the Audience. It was fun enough. I guess if you're a diehard fan of the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids franchise, you would love it. But otherwise, it's just a standard 3D show that makes me sad Rick Moranis is retired. Since my last visit, this is apparently no longer playing at this theater, because now that it's okay to like Michael Jackson again, Disney insisted on the return of Captain EO, possibly one of the greatest collaborations of Jackson, George Lucas, and Francis Ford Coppola ever to involve robots. Then there's Journey into a um, so let's talk about Figment for a second. Um, I'm harsh on the idea of Figment because again, when I made this video, I didn't know about the original uh, Journey into Imagination. So I didn't know that Figment used to be a good character and I just knew him in this annoying form. <laughs> um, I see no reason not to bring Dave Goals back as Figment, but also it's like you have Dave Goals in the Imagination Institute and you don't have him play Bunsen Honeydew. Like, let's what are you thinking, Disney? What are you thinking? Um, the the 
honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point Dreamfinder comes back and they tie him into the sea lore. I haven't read the Figment comics, so I don't know if the young, sexy Dreamfinder has a sea a Society of Floors Adventures connection or not, but I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, since this, Michael Jackson has been re-canceled <laughs> since, this, since this video. It's interesting because Figment might be Dave Gold's most prominent non-Muppet role. It's like, other than his cameo in Inside Out, I can't think of any other non-Muppet voice work he's done. Um... Okay, that makes You know, I heard, I don't know if this is true, but I heard that nowadays Muppet Studios is a subsidiary of Imagineering, which is very interesting to me. Um, okay, he is not connected to Society of Explorers and Adventurers, but there's still time for them to connect all that together or for him to be like the mad cold source of inspiration for a particular explorer or adventurer. Anyway, I'm, I'm very hard on Figment here, but... Uh, my feelings towards the character have obviously softened since then, now that I know more about his history. Um, I also, um, I, I mentioned in the podcast we played earlier that I used to work in my parents' church nursery, and there was a doll of figment in that church nursery, but I had never been to Florida, or I had never been to Epcot yet at the time, so I didn't recognize him. And I was just like, who's this purple dragon character? And it's like, the tag says Disney Parks. I don't know who this character is. Uh, but the the figment doll was particularly creepy because it had a mouth that was like stiff open like this and it had a broken neck the head was always dangling with that stiff open mouth and then i uh borrowed that doll from the nursery later in the post credits tag of the dave does disney finale musical imagination where idol teaches you about the five senses and gets annoyed by a purple CGI dragon named Figment. Yeah, I know all about the senses. But mostly he just gets annoyed by Figment. Oh, totally. I don't draw my sights. Out of sight. Okay. Come on, everybody. Here we go. It's not about listening with your ears. It's about listening with your imagination. With F-I-G-L-E-N-T, you can see things differently. Over and over and over and over and over and over and yeah, why couldn't this have been a shooter ride? It's enough to make you want to leave Future World and never come back. So now we move on to the World Showcase, where we can experience firsthand just how ignorant I am of other cultures. Uh, but this is America, where we unapologetically bastardize them. Uh, it's not the same Figment doll. Tony bought his Figment doll for those videos, because uh, this was in uh, this was in Connecticut that, that this Figment doll happened. Um, I borrowed it, but I brought it back to the church. Anyway, there's the single girls reference, the clip used from the same episode that the earlier clip was. Other countries' cultures in a gross quest for moral and military supremacy. I forgot. Bring on the imperialistic condiments. What Future World attempts to do with science, nature, and technology, World Showcase attempts to do with international culture by giving us a tour of the nations of the world. All 12 of them. Boy, that would have made Yakko's world a lot easier to memorize. United States, Canada, Mexico, Norway, and Germany now hold one piece. Italy, Morocco, France, England, China, Japan. Each pavilion of World Showcase. That, that Animaniac bit was one of the first gags I thought of for Epcot, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still happy with that. I came very close a couple years later when I uh, interviewed Rob Paulson and Maurice LaMarche at Kineticon. I thought about asking Rob Paulson to actually just recite the like just print up the world showcase version and ask him to do it but i decided against that I, d I decided not to yes i didn't have cable as a kid so i do not get all your sponge beam references but also i'm pretty sure charlie used the imagination clip in his original uh, disney world countdown um Uh, I think the ceiling shot earlier was from, I think it was from the test track queue, but I, hold on, I need to go back and see. Back. 
Rose Quest for Moral and Military Supremacy. Hello again, yeah. Rory Gilmore. On the imperialistic condiments. What future world attempts to do with science, nature, and technology? I believe that's the test track. World showcase to do yeah. with international I culture think. by giving us a tour of the nations of the world, all twelve of them. Boy, that would have made Yakko's world a lot easier to memorize. United States, Canada, Mexico, Norway, and Germany, now one piece. Italy, Morocco, France, England, China, Japan. Each pavilion of World Showcase features a fast food restaurant, a fancier sit-down restaurant, a couple of gift or specialty shops, and usually one major piece of entertainment, such as a ride, film, or live show. There are also street performers, characters from the country in question, and some more treats. They're basically very tiny museums of very abridged national history. The country in five seconds, if you will. The best. That's another reference I would not have made today. But um, the music here is uh, violin, uh, which now is Disney music, wasn't at the time. Um, it's uh, from Monkey Island 2. I was originally thinking I'd have different music for each country in World Showcase and like really choose thematically appropriate music. But again, when the first episode took me over a year to finish, I was like, okay, let's just get this over with. And I, when I didn't have other music, I used Monkey Island or King's Quest just because it's like generic adventuring music as we go on the journey. The thing about each area is that the employees are all people, generally students, from these different nations. They're paid to be friendly, so they will humor you as you ask a bunch of questions about their homeland. I know there's no uh, India. Total douche, you know? Tell me, is your so there's no India at World Showcase. This office clip was the only... Die, um, has... th this office clip was the first culturally insensitive question clip I could so think of. No? Okay. It's still very cool. Going clockwise, we start out with Mexico. Much like the land, this is your stop on a rainy day because Mexico is located inside a giant pyramid. After passing by some art displays, you find yourself in a town square at nighttime. As always, the atmospheric Disney magic is in full effect here, and despite its small size, the village feels fully alive. In the back is the Grand Fiesta ride. And of course, ride, my camera was terrible in low light. Caballeros. Even though Jose Carioca is Brazilian, but hey. This is a boat ride that starts off taking you past the dining area for the fancy restaurant, which is good because it's not like Orlando's version of Pirates of the Caribbean had the decency to do that. And the ride continues to trigger your pirate-related nostalgia by taking you past the Blood Island Volcano. You fool! You've given cheese to a lactose intolerant volcano god! No, Although I guess if I'm going to make a LucasArts reference here, it probably should be Grim Fandango. <laughs> The ride follows Jose and Panchito as they try and locate Donald for the big Three Caballeros reunion concert. It's a simple plot, but it makes me realize how awesome a Blues Brothers ride would be. They broke my watch! Anyway, the animatronics here are sub It's a Small World level, with most of the action taking place on video screen, facing help. the cartoon characters with live action footage. And also like It's a Small World, you will never get the song out of your head. But there are some amusing visual gags, and if you have any nostalgia at all for the Three Caballeros movie, you're almost guaranteed to get at least some enjoyment from the ride. And hey, at least we're not trying to chase this guy. Nope, Universal owns Blues Brothers. Because we failed geography, we learned that right next to Mexico is Norway. Which I guess would make this Norwegian wood. Isn't it good? Norway features World Showcase's other boat ride, Maelstrom. This one doesn't tie in with any established Disney franchise, since apparently they... Oh boy, would that change. <laughs> boy, would that change. Ah. I have not been back to Florida since I replaced by Frozen, but... Uh... I have heard mixed reports on how good the ride is. Wisp is back. Hey, buddy, you want me to pay attention to you? Hey, buddy. Do you, do you need to be fed again? I don't know. Your brother has been so quiet. Um, anyway, yeah, I, I've not been back since Maelstrom was replaced by Frozen, but, uh, I've heard some people I trust 
who really like it and some people like us who really hate it. So I've, I've seen some footage of it and uh, it looks okay, <laughs> but uh, I can't really judge till I ride it myself. Couldn't even think of a Norwegian Disney character for their topiary, but it's still fun. While still not quite a thrill ride, Maelstrom is a tiny bit We were all predicting a Frozen re-theme. It's got some mild drops, some backwards parts, trolls. It's not very long, but it's good fun. At the end of the ride is a film on Norwegian culture, but if you're desperate to get through here without actually learning anything, you can quickly exit through the theater with the people who just watched the film. Next, we move on to China. And even though it's China and not Japan, they were still nice enough to include a tribute to everyone's least favorite Yu-Gi-Oh character. Hey, Taya, what do you think of- Friendship is the best thing ever! Don't you agree? Damn it! Sure, why not? China has a larger outdoor section than the previous- Again, you do a bridge clip, because when really I can't think of jokes, I do reference. I spend hours walking around it. Until I remember how much I paid to get in here and realize that I need to be entertained and fast. So there's the shops, some nice museum areas, and the first of several Circle Vision shows. What's Circle Vision? I'm glad you asked. In Disney's ongoing quest to out-gimmick IMAX, these educational films give you smaller screens that wrap around the room so that you can see something in every direction. It's actually a pretty neat idea since it allows for cool flyovers of these nations' countrysides, and at its best, it's like a great panoramic image in motion. The problem is, it doesn't always work. I'm not sure exactly how these are made, but I presume that there's some sort of device with several cameras mounted on it pointing out in a circle, and the camera operator moves this device around to get the shots. The problem is, sometimes it doesn't seem like each camera is secured quite as tightly as it should be. And or again, I don't remember I, I don't remember where I got these photos from showing a circle vision uh, camera behind the scenes, so I, I should have credited whoever uh, provided this photo, but I do not remember who it was from. Doubt exactly as they should be, or things like that. The result is tiny shakes and movements in each camera's image that are just slightly out of sync with each other. When you add in that each film projector has a slight margin of error for image position or shake, the effect can sometimes be something like this. Okay, so it's rarely that bad, but it can be distracting. But if that sort of thing doesn't bother you, Circle Vision films can be a really fun way to see another country without ever having to leave the comfort of Orlando. Next, we pass through Africa, which is... A bridge! That's all Africa gets, is a bridge. And it's not even always an accessible bridge. Sometimes it's up because they have to float out the props for the fireworks show. Animal Kingdom will pay a little more attention to this continent, but for now, enjoy bongo drums and maybe a guy whittling. Ooh, and an ice cream stand. Then we move on to Germany. Not only is it the land that launched a thousand faulty towers quotes, Oh, would you like a drink before the war? Mean that our trespasses will be uh, uh, tied up with piano wire. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Again, I go a little overboard with the clips here without actually saying anything, just using clip upon clip upon clip. Did you stop talking about the war? Me? You started it? We did not start it. Yes, you did. You invaded Poland. <laughs> But it's also the home of that most Aryan of princesses, Leafy Green and the Seven Shrubs. Why, and there's Princess Healthy Tan herself. Germany doesn't really have any show or ride, but it does have a Christmas shop. Yeah, I guess I didn't really mention uh, earlier that uh, my first Epcot visit was during Flower and Garden, so there were a lot of topiaries to go. Uh, and at the time, I did not realize that they were only up for a couple months a year. I just assumed there were always these uh, these different plants. And it has trains. After so many rides that you must be this tall to enjoy, it's nice of them to offer something to the microscopic people. The rest of us can't ride the trains, but we can certainly watch them. Mr. Sarkowitz, aren't you in fact a train spotter? What? Don't you in fact spot trains? Man, what is it about Germany that brings out my inner John Cleese fanboy? And over here is Mr. Hilter. <laughs> Good afternoon. Next up is Italy, which also doesn't have a show or a ride, but it has a very fancy looking courtyard. And it has... Okay, guys, seriously? Lady and the Tramp aren't from Italy. They ate Italian food in one scene in the movie, but you notice how all the humans other than Tony and Joe speak with an American accent? Okay, I guess that's not always indicative, but they're still not from Italy. Just because they invented the spaghetti kiss does not qualify them to be Italy's topiary. 
After that horrible display of a lack of research, we move on to the country that Epcot seems proudest of. Ah, just like we left it with the USA in charge! Yes. I never did that game myself, so uh, I mentioned it back, like I mentioned it just in a post-credits uh, text thing back when it was Kim Possible, um, but I never played the game myself, and uh, when I lived in Florida before I I became a Phineas and Ferb fan, so I was like, I, I didn't feel a particular drive to spend my time walking around playing a phone game. But, uh, you know, I mean, that's what I'm saying. They, they have so little Pinocchio representation at the Italy Pavilion, and it's right there. I know, right? It's like putting a California theme park in California, the state. Yes, Chandler has made a video all about the Phineas and Ferb game, which uh, I have came in. So if you go to his channel, you can uh, take a look at that. And like every other country represented here, they present what we're best known for, fried stuff. Okay, I'm not going to read too much into the fact that the U.S. Pavilion is bigger than all the others. After all, they portrayed our nation just as accurately as all the others. We all know how our national economy and culture is based exclusively on colonial ends. That's why Bob Newhart is the richest man in the country. The United States features two pieces of entertainment. The first is a show called The American Adventure, a combination of animatronics and film clips nice. featuring great moments in American history, ending with a montage of several influential Americans. Once again, I'm not going to read anything into the fact that they linger on Walt's image longer than anyone else's. Right across the way from that, they have a big concert stage where they often have weekend concerts by various famous people, like Danny Bonaducci's TV brother. Compared to the other countries, the U.S. section has more of a focus on entertainment, but it's light on the shopping. I guess they figure that you can buy American stuff anywhere around here, but it's still odd that all we get is this tiny little shop. But at least you can buy stuff themed after your favorite American athletes, like that British guy. Next, we move on to Japan, which has even more gardens than China. Hmm. It's very relaxing. Huh. So lovely and peaceful and... Ah, okay, 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 gotta focus, gotta focus. Once again, not much entertainment, but a lovely setting, and the Japan gift shop will probably be of interest to all my fellow geeks. But what am I talking about? Most of us own this stuff already. We then move on to Morocco. I confess all my knowledge of Morocco comes from Casablanca, so... I fully expect to run into Claude Rains while I'm here. This is another small one, without much in the way of entertainment other than street performers, but I do like the atmosphere. I like to pretend I'm on the Village of the Crown from King's Quest VI. Old lamps for new! Old lamps for new! And then there's France. And wow, there are a lot of Disney characters from France. You couldn't have lent one to Norway or Italy? There's also a lot of food in France, plus another Circle Vision show, although this one's only half the number of screens, so I guess it's a semi-Circle Vision show. I feel kind of ripped off, though. I spent hours hanging out in France, and not once did I get stalked by a cute, quirky brunette. Although I didn't get stalked by a species-blind skunk either, so I guess it evens out. After that, we cross a bridge featuring Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella, and their princes, because I guess nobody could agree on which country they belong in, but they had to be near each other so they could argue about whose castle was better. We also passed the secret back entrance to Epcot, which I'll get back to when we talk about the resorts. Then the next stop on our tour is England. England, England, England. The first evening poster clip. <laughs> because I am a man of many esoteric references. It's true, it's true. Finally, a third ride. Yes, it's a country this company has a fine history with, going all the way back to Dick Van Dyke's accent and Mary Poppins. Ah, but I kid my all-time favorite Disney movie. Okay, so technically this land is dedicated to the entire United Kingdom, but England seems to get the main focus. Of course, there's a tea shop, which most of my friends would enjoy because so many of them are addicted to tea. Although, personally, I prefer my caffeine cold and carbonated, but... I have since become much more of a tea drinker than I was at that time, uh, obviously for throat reasons. Um, so, uh, 
I, yeah, I, I, I am much more tea centric now than I used to be. I still think it's funny that uh, England's biggest shop is dedicated to uh, a drink they all consume, but mostly people from other places they colonized. I have not been back to Florida, obviously, since the Skylanders are up, so it'll be interesting to see how they actually affect the sight lines. But on the other hand, holy crap, they have hobnobs. Ah, hobnobs are one of my favorite snacks ever. I love hobnobs. Ah, I'm so excited. Hobnobs. Ah. Although I'm a boring guy who likes my hobnobs. Fans, but last time I checked, they do not have Jaffa cakes. So after this, I went back and they did have Jaffa cakes for a while. So I filmed myself trying Jaffa cakes. And then that footage got lost when my hard drive died and I didn't have it backed up anywhere else. So the only time I've ever had Jaffa Cakes was on camera, but that footage is lost forever. Unless I find somewhere that I secretly backed it up without remembering, but I'm pretty sure it's lost forever. So uh, that, that was, uh, again, my, my fascination with Jaffa Cakes was only because of that one episode of Space. <laughs> so, uh, so, never. There was, um, I mean, Shaun of the Dead is also a universal joint, but I know there was one year where uh, I think they turned the area outside Mulligan's Pub in Universal Hollywood into a mini Shaun of the Dead scare zone. And by that, I mean they had someone dressed as Shaun with someone dressed as Zombie Ed on, like, a leash. Oh, yeah, now I back up everything. Like, now I, I basically never delete anything anymore. I keep every SD card I've ever filmed on now because I've lost many hard drives. And I'm, I'm like, now, now I'm a paranoid digital hoarder. There's also a toy store, a sporting goods store. Once again, not a whole lot of entertainment, which is kind of odd. You would think the land that brought us Monty Python, Fauci Towers, P.G. Wodehouse, J.R. Tolkien, Douglas Adams, Neil Gaiman, Stephen Fry, Hugh Laurie, Rowan Atkinson, Kenneth Branagh, Michael Caine, Space, Shaun of the Dead. Ha yeah, that, that was as many Google image searches as I did before I was like, why am I making this harder on myself? But the Office Extras, Coupling, Red Dwarf, Frickin' William Shakespeare, and the good version of Death at a Funeral would know how to keep us entertained. But it's not completely lacking. There are some street performers, and there's a cover band of a little-known quartet named after a misspelled insect who are apparently kind of popular over there. Finally, we conclude our tour of the planet with the land of poutine and honey, Canada. It's more than just Robin Sparkles videos, Dudley do cartoons, and dudes named Rousedower. It's also Martin Short movies. Yes, Ed Grimley himself hosts this circle vision look at our neighbors to the north, a land of waterfalls and buildings that don't seem to have much purpose. And I know they've now placed this with uh, two other SDTV alums. Uh, I haven't watched the whole thing, but the footage I saw of the new circle vision show with Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara just made me wonder why they bothered hiring comedians if it's not going to be funny anymore. Um, that's true. I, in the video we mentioned earlier, I, I make a Shaun of the Dead reference in my cameo. <laughs> yes, they should. That is exactly what should happen, but it won't. <laughs> um, they've also, they also, I don't know, again, haven't been back in so long. I don't know what's up now, but I know that, uh, I think by the time I edited this, they replaced it with a more generic uh, British music cover band who also did like the police and stuff. Uh -huh. <laughs> now we're talking now. Well, but that would have to be at the DreamWorks Theater then. Like, I know they hired Levy and O'Hara specifically because they're famous because of, uh, well, specifically to cash in on Shit's Creek's popularity. But again, why are you hiring two of the funniest people in history to do a non-funny, dry version of a show? Like, I get that they're also doing it because people were tired of the wacky Martin Short version, but why are you sticking with comedians? Uh, that sounds right. That, that sounds familiar. <laughs> yes, just have Martin Freeman go around uh, since not everything he's in is 
uh, Disney, but at least one of the franchises he's in is Disney. Although, and, and I'm pretty sure he's a character who's not tied up at Universal Orlando. <laughs> Seriously, I've got some of these pavilions have so much cool stuff. Why are the others so half-assed? And hey, I didn't know Bambi was Canadian. Or is he? Why should I trust them if they claim Lady and the Tramp are Italian? I don't know if I can trust Epcot or Canada. They're not even a real country anyway. At Obligatory night, reference. has its own fireworks show, Illuminations. I hear it's fantastic, but I haven't had a chance to see it myself yet. Which, according to the internet, makes me fully qualified to judge it. Nah, it's okay. Does Epcot hold up to Walt Obviously, Disney I rectified vision? that later. Certainly not. But I think he still would have liked it, even if he wasn't completely satisfied with it. I am in no position to say what Walt would or would have liked. I, I was trying... At this point, I think I was still paranoid about uh, getting shut down by Disney because I didn't know that Disney would get to the point. Um, see, uh... uh Back when I was planning on doing different music for every pavilion, I was going to use Servo's Canada song. But then when I didn't want to spend time thinking of music for every single pavilion and I was just letting music bleed over, I changed my mind there. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I was at this point, I did not know how OK Disney would be with this series existing and I didn't want to be shut down so i was concerned i also knew that there would be the possibility that i would uh if i was staying in orlando might want to work there someday so i was trying to temper all my criticisms with nice things to say so i wanted to end with a positive thing to say about epcot overall even though i was critical of it so that's why i said i think walt would have liked epcot even though i have no fucking idea <laughs> Yes, that's another video I'm in, uh, is uh, where, I, where I portray the voice of Walt seeing uh, Epcot as it stands, and uh, you will just have to watch that video on the Fire Blast Studios channel to know what we think Walt would think of Epcot. <laughs> and no, Canada isn't the free beer place. It's certainly uneven. Not everything in the park is as entertaining as it could be, and much of the educational stuff only begins to look at the very tip of the iceberg. But if it gets people interested in learning more about these subjects on their own, then it's done its job. Like a really overpriced children's museum. There aren't many rides, but Test Track and Mission Space are spectacular enough on their own to warrant a visit. And as rushed as the cultural glances are, you still get to meet people from all over the world, try food from different nations, and so on. Which, sadly, for a lot of us, is more international cultural experience than we get in a lifetime. Epcot is best known for this blend of education and entertainment, but that's not what separates it from the Magic Kingdom-style parks. No, the thing that separates it from those is booze. Lot this part is inauthentic because I'm not really a drinker, but I knew that this was the reason Epcot was thought of as the grown-up park was because you could drink, even though I rarely do. Lots and lots and lots of booze. What a lot of these pavilions lack in entertainment, they make up for in libations. There's a reason Future World closes early and World Showcase opens late. They don't want to give people time to get wasted before going on mission space. Anyway, join us next time when we move on to Animal Kingdom, where we continue the educational tour and encounter all sorts of wildlife, including the deadliest animal of all. It turns out it's man. <laughs> I didn't know what else to use for the end credits, so I reused the um, uh, Three Caballeros reference there. <clears throat> and that Epcot. That is my role as designated driver.